the era. The, the adoption yeah, era. Yeah, the adoption era. Yes, uh, and I really feel the need to define this as an era, to um, call it that you know, we we um, have recorded in history, and even people that are in college now, our, our young people are getting educated, and if you use the term boarding school era, it, it connotes, you know, somebody will think of, of, they'll know, they'll think of trains taking hundreds of children away and children having to grow up in these institutions. But the, during this time where so many children are being removed from our communities and our families, there isn't a, ti a time for this. We're not, we haven't called it anything. And I think it's time to start referring to it as the adoption era. It was a time um, when it, um, there was a government, the government was had a policy to remove us. And they used um, churches and different organizations about 1940 to 1978. And I say 1940 because that's when um, the social work actually became a profession, more of a profession, and where they you were then used social work practice and standards to remove children. Okay. So, um, and in those, in that time period, they would come in and look at communities, Indian communities or Indian families, and judge them by the white standards that they had been taught. Um, certain many of bedrooms or certain uh, had to have electricity, had to have running water. And people on the reservations did not have electricity during the 50s and 60s up into the 70s, often didn't have a lot of the amenities. Um, and I always say that instead of trying to figure out how they could help families get running water or get electricity in their home, they removed children instead. I want to think that some people actually thought they were doing good by us. But what I don't understand is how anybody could look at a home and say, it doesn't have any, the house doesn't have running water, the house doesn't have electricity, um, dad might be drinking, people might be feeling, you know, might be in a hard way. But why the solution was never, how do we help the family instead of taking the child? I never have understood that. So this time period from the 40s to 1978, and I say 1978 because that's when the Indian Child Welfare Act was passed. And the act was passed as a result of much testimony bought, brought before legislation defining, uh, describing what I just talked about mm -hmm. and the high numbers of children being taken. And at that time, um, they also were seeing that children that had been removed from their homes uh, removed from their communities, not being around any uh, of their native culture, also had high incarceration rates, high suicide rates, and uh, other uh, factors in their lives that were attributed to not being uh, with their family. So the act was passed in 1978. 7.6% of children in need of placement, out of home placement, in the United States across the board, are native children, 7.6%. We are less than 1% of the population in the United States. So we're still very disproportionately represented. And again, we're still, I still say, and you'll find that I think most social workers would agree, most people that work in child welfare will tell you that um, it is because we need more, we still need more focus on how do we keep the family together. What we have with the Indian Child Welfare Act is we have a federal law in place that gives us that legislative um, f foundation to say this is what we have to look at. We've made progress to date. Like here in Hennepin County, in the uh, Child Protection Unit, there is an Indian Child Welfare Unit, and that has Indian Child Welfare social workers. And we have an Indian Child Welfare Law Center here in Minneapolis. We have a lot, uh, we have judges that just see Indian Child Welfare cases. So we have a lot of more of education and a lot more um, advocacy and, uh, and many more resources, yet this time period that has happened from in, in the adoption era, and, and then even if you go back previous to that boarding school, we still have a lot of, of um, historical trauma that we're, we're healing from. And we find that our families are, are still in that place of, of healing, but while the statistics still might not be where we want them to be, I think what is positive is we do have, we are gaining more resources. First Nations Repatriation Institute's um, goal, 
the, 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 the initial goal is to re bring people back to their homeland, restore people to their homeland. Repatriation, in its definition, means that restore citizenship and to re return one's, to one's homeland. The most important part of understanding who we are as Indian people is to have our feet and that experience of having our feet on the land that where we come from, our homeland, where our ancestors have been. Um, they always say that when we walk on the earth and when we uh, are on the land where our relatives generations back were, their DNA is in that earth and that's um, sacred to us and we understand that. And for someone who maybe never even took a step on their homeland. That's part of what uh, the work that I do. That's what I want them to have, experience, and see. What Cho Chage um, means the generation past, the generation present, and the generation yet to come. In all our Indian ceremonies, uh, we always rec remember those who went before us, we remember and acknowledge this generation now, and we are always pray for the generation yet to come, every single ceremony. I also think it'd be safe to say every tribe has that component in their ceremonies. So if that is true, if this is a sacred truth, then my grandmother prayed that for me, her grandmother prayed that for her, her grandmother prayed it for the, it goes back generation after generation after generation. So if that's true, then somewhere along the line, when these hard times were coming on us, when, when, um, uh, when we were being forced onto reservations, when we were being given rations and dying, when our people were being indiscriminately massacred, when our children were being taken and put in boarding school, when we were being taken and just put systematically put into white homes and communities, somewhere along the line, people who are praying for us. And when we think about the power of, that that has in our lives, and it tells us then that we were thought of before we were born, and that a plan was here for us, and it's given us that, that spiritual guidance and that, that, um, that energy that just brings us back to that circle to know who we are and where we come from. And even in doing that, we don't have to negate everything that happened in our life prior to that. It just expands everything that we have. 